Kunnus Satoshi of Galair, and welcome to the Linux Lads. Um, as you've probably noticed, I'm not Shane, so t uh, Shane is off sunning himself somewhere down in Wexford, which isn't very sunny. But um, so today I will be your host. I'm Connor, and we're joined quite graciously by Artyom Zorn. Hello, Artyom. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on the show. So I'll start the show by going through the ad read. So the ad read this episode is for the Debian project. Debian, or it's also known as Debian GNU slash Linux, is a distribution composed of free open source software developed by the community supported Debian project. It was established by Ian Murdoch in the 16th of August, 1993. It's first version was released in the 15th of September 1993 and the first stable edition was released on the 17th of June 1996. The Debian stable branch is the most popular edition for personal computers and servers and is the basis for many other distributions. You would not have project su projects such as Ubuntu, Pop! OS, Linux Mint, Elementary OS, MX Linux and of course Zorn OS without the hard work of the Debian developers. So go to debian.org slash donations to donate in any way that you can. This can be time, money, or the even except old equipment. So, Mike, what have you been up to? Um, well, over the last two weeks, I was, well, actually last week I was traveling. I uh, did what I call my annual, or half of my annual pilgrimage. That means my journey to the east to, to see my family. I went to uh, Prague, Vienna, and then we were visiting friends uh, in Zurich. Uh, by in there I actually went to uh, have a very nice meal in the uh, Google campus because uh, uh, my friend uh, works in there. Very, very nice meal. Very nice. Mm -hmm, fancy. Very nice campus, yeah. And um, uh, yeah, so I've been I've been all over the place. Uh, Hopefully, I didn't catch anything nasty. So I'm <laughs> quite a timely joke there. Yeah, I know. And I'm back to back to Dublin and back to back to work. So uh, yeah, everything's going back to normal. And normally we rotate, and of course, in the spot where I say uh, for Shane's, I'm like Mike was traveling. Shane is traveling, and that's the reason why he's not here. But um, so for me, what I've been up to is. Um, as of only a couple of days ago, I did a com complete clean install and installed um, Manjaro Cinnamon Edition, and I'm actually really like it. Um, I'm also considering getting um a widescreen monitor because at the moment I have one um small twenty three inch monitor and then a, a hand me down fourteen inch. Uh, Dell monitor f that like has VGA cable out the back like ancient thing that's been hand handed me down from a couple of um, desktops ago and that's my second monitor and I'm thinking a wide monitor would pretty much take the the um, the role of both of them and they're actually coming down in quite reasonable prices I'm t about 200 sterling or 300 sterling that price range on on Amazon.co.uk, you can get kind of LG, Samsung monitors, kind of reputable brand widescreen monitors. So, if they're that reasonably priced, I actually might consider getting one. So the the that's the things that I've been up to. Uh, anything interesting you've been up to, Artyom, in the last two weeks? Yeah, so mainly just been working on the new fifteen point two release of Zornos, which we're about to launch tomorrow. So that's basically been the past two weeks. Yeah, it's it's well tomorrow, so that's that's quite a timely um, thing that you've been on this episode. So uh, looks to be, I'm just you're kind enough to share a, a little teaser of of the show of the release notes to us here. So I'm looking through them. Um, you've support for the new uh, AMD graphics cards, and you say the Intel tenth uh, generation processors. Um, is this things that you you've been stuff you've been doing yourself or is this because you inherit the the, the latest kernel and it's it's inbuilt into the little kernel or in, into the kernel or is it a bit of both uh it's mainly uh, the new kernel release that 
um, you know, the Linux kernel developers have put out over the past few months, as well as uh, Ubuntu has been porting it over to the 18.04 base, which Zorn OS 15 is based on as part of the hardware enablement stack. So we're inheriting all of the, the great features and work that these two teams have been doing. So big kudos to them for all the work. Yeah, yeah, fair play to um the the upstream developers. Um, no, the the only reason I brought that up is because you seem to be highlighting Intel here, and I was thinking, is there anything special about Intel? Like, is there any support for AMD Ryzen, like, or the Threadripper? <laughs> uh, but I'm guessing if if you're inheriting the hardware um, enablement stack from the Ubuntu developers um, all of that is just inherent in it, it, was, it um, you get uh, all the AMD goodness as well yeah it's important to have it preloaded in the operating system uh, from the get go so that people with that hardware can easily install it without any messy setup so that's why we do these uh, incremental point releases every couple months or so that makes, makes sense I, I also see that you um have support for the newer MacBook and MacBook Pro keyboards and touchpads. So those of you who have a MacBook and are sick of Mac OS, then slap Zorn OS on that bad boy. And uh, in the process, uh, get a better keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or just get a ThinkPad. And you'll automatically <laughs> get a better take keyboard. Um... So we'll do a bit of news. Mike, you put in that Facebook are now um, one of the major sponsors of OBS. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like every episode we release, there is a major sponsorship announcement for the likes of OBS Blender or, uh, you know, all of these high profiles open source project. And obviously the more the merrier. And um uh, I just have to see, say that I'm really glad to see Facebook doing being in the news for something else than uh, privacy breaches and uh, being nasty, and I'm really glad that OBS, which is a project that uh, I, you know, I used to do a backup recording of this uh, of this podcast, uh, and it's I'm, I'm barely scratching sub, uh, the uh, surface of it what it can actually do, but it's amazing and it's used from you know hobbyists all the way to professionals and. This this will help them. This is, I think, to the tunes of to the tune of fifty thousand dollars a year, if I'm or at least, uh, uh, if I remember correctly. And uh, it's great that such an amazing project is going to be is is going to be supported. Yeah, I think they have um, a certain sponsorship levels of the project, and uh, Facebook are coming in at this at the uh, fifty thousand level, which. Um, is there a diamond tier? Um, I do not know if... Um, just reading through the article here. Yeah, it, it, it does appear that this is their, their top level tier. So I was, I was just wondering if they had a, a higher up tier. But no, the, the 50,000 seems to be their their um, their top level tier. So it's a minimum of 50,000. Needless to say, Facebook could be, could be sending more money their way. But we don't know as it's a minimum of 50,000. But um, fair play to them. Uh, and as you say, it's um, some bit of positive news. Um in a very long string of negative news for Facebook. Um, and they're not beholden to this sponsorship. There would there are other people who um, are in the same tier. So it's not the case of um, Facebook are now calling the shots and saying, we're giving you 50,000 a year. Therefore, you must make these specific changes. And we need to be overbearing or something like that. It's good that they're, they're now um, in, being independent and... Um, so that's good. So in the next bit of news, uh, LibreOffice 6.4.1 is released with uh, over 120 bug fixes. Um, LibreOffice is a, is a fantastic project. It's um, it's taking over um, from the old OpenOffice, which many people, it turns out, actually still think still think of. Um, those people who are non-tech savvy out there, um, when they think of the, it just has the brand recognition. So, um, but LibreOffice um, is by far the better project in my opinion. So it's 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 good to give them the shout out. Um, it's a fantastic project. I um use it on all of my Linux distributions, and uh, slowly but surely I'm kind of injecting a bit of free software onto my dad's 
computer. He's running Windows 10, but he he has Firefox, he has LibreOffice, he has VLC, and uh, uh, Firefox. In fact, he um when when he got a new computer, he says, "Connor, can you put that Mozilla on my computer?" I went, "I shall do." <laughs> uh so that's good. Um, Mike, any uh, Mike, any thoughts on this release? Well, uh. I haven't tried it yet, I think, although being on a, on a rolling distribution, I think uh, I'm not far off. But I use LibreOffice uh, mostly calc every day at work because uh, it's just the office suit and uh, I, I've been... Uh, I think I've been quite public on this show about my uh, preferences for uh, that, uh, you know, uh, visit data for the most... Uh, comma separated values and that kind of that kind of thing but if you need something a bit more fancy maybe with some reporting capabilities then definitely uh libreoffice does what what i needed to do uh artium uh, is libreoffice default on uh, uh, like is it the default office suite if you have any on on zorin yeah yeah absolutely so uh in this new release that we're putting out tomorrow uh we actually have version 6.3.5 which was also released in the past week or two and that's mainly designed for better support for larger organizations so they actually recommend going one release behind to make sure that you know enterprise deployments are, are fully supported so that's that's what we include in this release and can you imagine ever having like not having LibreOffice as a part of your application uh, what you call it application um, suite suite in in, <laughs> in sorry in OS um, I mean, like LibreOffice is so mature and so feature rich that um, I don't see very close competitors that are open source, especially uh, that we can include. Uh, I think the community, the developer ecosystem, the support that's available out there, especially for, for organizations is just really stellar that it just makes sense to include LibreOffice apart from other suites. And as I was curious, because I'm on uh, Manjaro, as uh, you guys were um, speaking there, I decided to do a quick look up. So by default, uh, we're, uh, when I say we're, me, myself, uh, <laughs> and Manjaro, uh, so that's the we, apparently. Um, so Manjaro is actually on the 6.3.5 release. And then I was curious, so I actually looked up and to, on the re, uh, repos, uh, the LibreOffice fresh version, and that is indeed on um, 6.4.1. So if you want the latest and greatest, um, just look up LibreOffice fresh um, on if you're on Manjaro or Arch and uh, have access to the repos. And I believe there might be a LibreOffice fresh uh, PPA if you want to add it to uh, an Ubuntu-based distribution. To be honest, LibreOffice has been so uh, stable and stellar uh, for so long that uh, I, you, I don't think there's ever been a time recently where I was when I was like really uh, impatiently waiting for the next release because uh, you know they they anything that they do obviously the more the better the better the bug the the less bu the fewer the bugs. And the more features, uh, and the faster it gets, the better. But uh, it's been it's for years. It's been really brilliant. Speaking of LibreOffice, um, an announcement recently is that uh, Collabra, which I believe are the um, the as kind of a commercial supported version of LibreOffice, and I believe they also do financial support for the Document Foundation and the LibreOffice project as well. Collabra Office is now available on iOS and Android. Um, I have installed the Android version, but um, it was pretty much just a very basic blank screen with a plus in the corner, as in, do you want to add a document? I don't. Um, I think it's mainly add an editing functionality at the moment, rather than do you want to create a brand new document? Um, and since I didn't have any sample documents on my device to mess around with, um, I I just said, oh, that's neat, and then. Didn't really do much testing with it beyond that. Have any of you guys check, uh, checked it out? 
I yeah, I have actually. I thought uh yeah, you can actually do uh, sorry, I said. Yeah, I've checked it out to myself very briefly as well. You can actually create a new text document, new spreadsheet, a new presentation. Uh and uh it's basically uh you know, you you click new, you say you click save and it will open it for you. Now a spreadsheet on a phone uh, that just that's just the stuff of nightmare for me obviously sometimes you just can't help it and need to i mean <laughs> obviously there might be some people who's, who can't help it and have to be have to be able to do some on the fly on the go editing of spreadsheets on their phone i feel very sorry for those people because uh, you know by definition spreadsheets i think are meant for big screens uh, but uh, if they need to, this is definitely a step in good direction because, uh, you know, it, it's a free and open source application. It can it uses uh, it uses open standards, uh, open file formats, and uh, we need more of that. I'm not sure how well it ties into the Nextcloud, how well it's integrated with uh, things like Nextcloud. Uh, there is a huge potential for having collaborative editing. Uh, you know where where it could really come to its own when you maybe not spreadsheets but when you have a pre presentation uh you know you can not only collaboratively create it or edit it comment on it but then you can take your phone to wherever you need to do the presentation and maybe i don't know if it's possible yet or if it's uh, intended but maybe you can use your phone as a uh, device from which the presentation is well presented really uh so that there's definitely future for this so speaking of mobile devices, we're, there's all sorts of smooth segues in this um, episode <laughs> today. Uh, the Unity 8 um, continuation that the UbiPorts project have taken over, they've decided to rename U Unity 8 and now it's apparently uh, Low Marie or Low Miri. Um, it's spelled uh, L-O-M-I-R-I. So um, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of the of the name. Um, I have to say immediately when when I first read it, I thought it was Lumery, as in L U M I or I. But um, I had to look at it a couple of times. Now it's definitely Lumery. So um, uh, I don't know if Lumery was taken or anything like that, or if genuinely could be there. The first thing that came into their mind is I did call it Lumery. So um, it's um. It's, but I suppose it's distancing themselves from the previous um, Ubuntu project of Unity. Um, who knows? They might be because uh, they call the operating system mobile phone operating system U uh, Ubuntu Touch um, still currently. So they might be thinking about renaming the the mobile operating system as well. Um, or this is this is now just the the new name for both their mobile operating system and the Unity 8 project and they're just renaming both the same thing which is uh, entirely possible um uh, have either of you guys actually used um, Ubuntu Touch or anything like that no i uh unfortunately during my last week travels i realized how much how dependent especially abroad i am on android applications so uh i have uh, i i obviously i would love to see um uh, ubuntu touch sailfish and all the other open source operate or you know alternative operating systems for mobile devices to take off but uh, and i would be able to try them depending how you know how uh, complete the experience is but i can't imagine completely not having android or ios uh, on uh, you know when 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 needed because uh, you know everything is everything is an app having said that though the the fact that they they've taken over ubuntu when ubuntu well, when canonical uh, can't uh, uh, the project and the fact that they are thriving and they uh, want to touch you want to touch, yeah, sorry, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so no, I didn't just announce. <laughs> I didn't just announce that you uh, that canonical can't you want to. That would be a, that would be a breaking news, right? Basically, when they the fact that they've been going on for so long, I don't know how long it's been. It must have been a few years, like 
of, I don't know, three, three years since uh, since Ubuntu Touch has gone away from uh, Canonical. And the fact that the project is still alive, alive well, and uh, that, uh, uh, that Lomiri and Ubuntu Touch are being uh, developed well that's uh, that's great hopefully it will one day become uh, possible uh, to basically just use an operating system like this and uh, not have not being dependent on uh, the duopoly of android and ios it was it was actually quite interesting when you're talking about um android support and yeah i agree with you because there's always that niggling thing like um uh, my go-to examples are your your WhatsApps uh, applications or your your banking applications or your two-factor uh, authentication a- a- applications that just exist solely on iOS or Android. Those are your two choices, and increasingly, um, banks are requiring you to uh, have their their application. F- uh, on your phone purely for authentication or in the case of a lot of these new uh newfangled um banks are are entirely based on the application i mean n26 doesn't literally does not exist in any capacity without it the without the application it goes through everything they have a web interface for it but let's say on the web interface you say oh i want to let's say i want to transfer 100 euro to mike because i'm feeling generous um oh, you definitely should <laughs> uh then automatically it says oh um go go pick up your phone for the authentication i'm like i, I mean i i i'm here i know all the codes in my head can i just not type them in no 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 it has to be in your phone um i i can get the uh, the idea of multi-factor but um uh it, it's it's annoying when it's just tied to one device um which i suppose there's a, a security argument um both ways one thing i will say is i do have a officially supported um uh, sailfish device which is an xperia x a2 and in order to be officially supported you pay the money i think it's like 40 or 50 dollars or something one-off payment you get official support and they will say we guarantee um android support and i think it's any it's android 8 support so as long as somebody publishes an android application and it supports the android 8 sdk then it will work on on uh, the sailfish official support officially supported sailfish devices uh, there's community ports i mean there's a there's a community port of sailfish os for my phone which is the oneplus 5t but immediately in the fre- uh, frequently asked questions it says is there friend um android support and i say no because this is a community port uh, which is unfortunate because if they had that then straight away i'll be wiping wiping android and putting sailfish os on on this device if it had android support Anyway, that was a rant and a half. But uh, do any any of you guys have any um, thoughts on the whole um, Android eco- ecosystem or in relation to free and open source um, mobile oper- operating systems? Yeah, so actually, I'm not sure if you've heard about a project called Anbox. Um, I have, yeah. Where yeah. They're, yeah, yeah, where they're containerizing Android apps for use on the Linux desktop. It's kind of quietly been chugging away for a few years, but there was an interesting announcement, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, by Canonical, where they were pitching it towards their cloud customers, but one thing that they were doing was using Anbox to containerize um, games, like Android games, so that you can actually launch a game streaming service for Android apps. Uh, I don't know if anyone's actually doing this at the moment, but it seems like a really cool use case and perhaps if Anbox has developed to such a state where it actually is possible to run games not only just Android apps uh, inside of Linux it could be an interesting scenario if say Android app developers might be able to uh, package their apps using say Snap or Flatpak using Anbox inside the runtime uh, in order to distribute their Android apps within Linux and make it appear like it's a native Linux app. I don't know if anyone's doing this at the moment, but um, it's something that could be interesting to look at. 
So uh, I think that's the end of the news. So that brings us to our main segment, which is uh, you, are you? <laughs> so <laughs> it's you. Um, so um, the Zorn OS project. Um, so how did you get started with the Zorn OS project? How did you think that, you know what? Uh, we can do this ourselves. I oh, when I say we, because I know it's not just yourself. Um, so how did you, plural, get started off uh, with the Zorn OS project? Yeah, so rewind back to the summer of 2008, and my brother and I, we first installed Linux onto our computer for the first time. Uh, it was Ubuntu 7.10, I think. Brings you way back, yeah. Uh, we kind of were just interested in customizing our computer and seeing what cool software is out there and we just came across some videos of the Compiz Cube. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> oh yeah, that was yeah, awesome. Yeah, we thought that was really cool back then. Everybody wanted yeah. one, yeah. And I, you know, wobbly windows on a cube with gears inside and uh, oh, those were the days, man. The windows burned down as well. Yeah. Uh, if you want it, yeah, it's crazy. Our, our, uh, our, obviously, I said, don't mean to interrupt, but Artyom will give you a little Easter egg here. I still have my CD of my first... Um, Linux distribution, which was no way. <laughs> uh, wow, six oh six LTS Kubuntu. Okay, you beat me. You beat <laughs> me there. <laughs> yeah, so back then, like I was twelve and my brother was fourteen, so you know we found all that Compass stuff very cool. But when we actually started using Linux on our computer, we saw the many other advantages that it has. You know that it was way faster. It was way more secure. It doesn't really get viruses really customizable, of course. And we kind of just thought to ourselves, you know, this is really cool. And most people haven't even heard of this. What if we could make it more accessible to the general public? Because when we first showed Linux to our dad, who was just a regular computer user, um, who was using Windows, he found it a bit jarring, even just for the fact that the interface doesn't resemble what he's used to. So, you know, you don't have the start menu, the taskbar that you would have in Windows. And that would be enough of a hindrance for um, a huge segment of the population we found uh, to not even be interested in something different from what they're familiar with. So we kind of thought to ourselves, um, if we can make the user interface more familiar, um, it could potentially open up the advantages of Linux to the general public and also at the same time we were thinking about doing a project for the young scientist competition do you guys know that i that was i was in it didn't win anything but i was in it oh really cool uh yeah we were in it we didn't win the whole competition <laughs> whatnot, like uh, of course but um it was a really good jumping point to start thinking about this project not just as a hobby but also something that could be useful generally in the world because we got a lot of interest from you know passers-by even the judges as well that made us really think that hey we should take this on as something as a long-term project and so we've been working on it ever since so that kind of brings me into the next question um who would you say uh zorn is aimed at so what kind of user are you aiming at um, I I get the hint from your your background there that your your background leading up to Zorn OS is that you're kind of going for the the grassroots maybe the um person who's who's not um in the tech industry it wouldn't be a particularly technical person and just wants their computer to be stable and just to work would be would that be a correct summarization. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's our number one use case that we're always thinking about um, to make it really accessible for pretty much anyone to use Linux. But we also see a lot of interest from people who have been using Linux for even 10 years. And they were saying, like, I was distro hopping for, for all these years and then I came across Sornos and it really clicked with me. And I've been using it for a lot longer than other distributions so like our philosophy is generally about making an operating system that's general purpose and that's stable and usable by as many people as possible and just generally providing a really good user experience and 
design on the desktop. What are the, ki what are the kind of uh, philosophies that you apply to, uh, to achieve that? Like, I mean, design philosophies, what to include, what not to include, um, uh, you know, uh, customizability versus, uh, versus uh, elegance or style, that kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, we don't have like very rigid philosophies and um, kind of points that we think about uh, when making customizations or changes, but we always think about who are our users, who are we trying to target, and whether this change that we're proposing makes sense. So essentially, every time we think about, say, including a new application, we run through it and make sure is this something that is intuitive? Is this something that any user can figure out how to use in five seconds that uh, they don't have to learn any jargon or uh, how to do something entirely new and different? Uh, but at the same time, giving them a feature set that's a lot more rich than say Windows and Mac, giving them the power to do a lot more and customize more about the desktop, which is something that Linux is inherently great uh, but also just making it super familiar and intuitive and um, not intimidating. Uh, because there are a lot of Linux projects that are um, kind of aimed more at advanced users and they do a, a really great job at that. But some of the decisions that are made, what kind of software to include, how to design it, uh, isn't really um, aimed and super friendly for, say, a grandma who's been using Windows for 10 years and just wants to browse the web. I, I click on the internet and I get my email. <laughs> that, that kind of... Exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, I was just thinking that um, pr probably the... It might have been the first time that I, I ever heard of Zorn OS, but um, if it wasn't the very first time, I think it was the very first time that I, I saw a kind of an in-depth demonstration of it even though it was kind of um, a very humorous take on it was actually um, Crazy Ken's uh, Computer Adventures I don't know if you're aware of that channel but um, mm -hmm. he's, I think he's 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 done a, f a fairly few fair few um, takes on Zorn OS uh, kind of following you along the on, so uh, he'll always get the latest version and say, oh, well, what's new in Zorn, Zorn OS and can I run it on this? Can I run it on the Mac Mini or whatever? And I think the very first yeah. um, uh video I saw of it is him running Zorn OS on a Mac Mini. So, and I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. that, that's actually quite interesting. And it's, 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 you have a re um, very unique uh, aesthetic and um, it's um, something that is, um, is well designed. Um, and there's little niceties here, there. I mean, the whole thing of your, your, your um, default landing page for Google is just a massive google and you just kind of search or um um or do you like if you could have you could have changed that in the meantime i don't know if you have or not but the, i remember that's one of the my abiding memories of you just have a, a nice kind of uh loading page in the in the um web browser once you get loaded and started up so it's a very kind of nice aesthetic and and um it's very accessible um I would say uh, maybe uh, one of my questions would be: Do would you have a computer that you would be aiming for? Would it be a lower end PC or just a, your average PC? Or yeah, uh, yeah. So like we have a large number of users with all sorts of different needs and computers that they're using it on, and we want to make it accessible to as many different kinds of hardware out there. So. By default, you know, the Zornos Core and Ultimate Editions, they use the GNOME desktop environment, mm -hmm. which has a really rich feature set, especially for newer computers, say touch-based computers. But at the same time, we find that a lot of people are interested in taking their old hardware and repurposing it, say, um, maybe as a hand-me-down or even just to use themselves, uh, because, say, that computer might be... Windows XP machine and you can't really use Windows XP anymore because it lost support but great thing about Linux is it's pretty lightweight so we've created a the light edition of Zorn OS which uses the XFCE desktop environment very good desktop and, environment yeah 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 and we try to make it as um, you know well designed and accessible as our 
ordinary GNOME editions, um, but also really lightweight so that it runs on that hardware and is really tailored towards, you know, old and low spec computers. So we try to target as many different kind of um, hardware setups as we can general purpose ones so when, you, when you're saying um that leads me on to one one of the uh, next questions we have for you is um if you're aiming for kind of with your Zerno West light um aiming for maybe older computers or something that has uh, less system resources would you be a ever consider an arm version like for, on the pinebrook pro or something like that yeah no the developments around the arm based hardware ecosystem have been really interesting over the past couple years and things are really heating up towards making it um making these kinds of single board computers say for example raspberry pi yeah. and pine box uh, like really powerful enough for you to be able to use it as a general purpose computer so that is something that we're looking at right now don't really have anything to announce just yet we're not actively working on it just yet but it's something that we would like to support um, you know, in the coming releases. And would that be something that you would be able to um, collaborate with upstream or, or get some of the the, the lessons that um, have been learned from people tinkering um, upstream? By that, I mean, um, there's uh, Ubuntu Mate running on, on the... Um, on the uh, Raspberry Pi, so that having an Ubuntu base and you guys having an Ubuntu base, maybe there could be some collaboration there, there upstream or something like that. Yeah, potentially down the line. Uh, it's something that we're not actively focused on just yet, but uh, is something that we would like to to focus on more uh, in the near future. Hopefully, you sell a uh, hardware yourself, don't? Uh, well, you have a hardware partnership with uh, at least two companies, don't you? On your on your website, I think. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Star Labs as well as Nova Custom in the Netherlands. Uh, they're our first two hardware partners, and we're working with a couple others at the moment to try to bring out some new uh, Linux-based, Zornos-based computers. Awesome. You mentioned new releases there. Uh, you are going to have a release tomorrow, a point release, don't you? Just great mm -hmm. that you found the time to be here rather than fretting about the last pre-release things. So, what can uh, what can people expect in uh, Zorin OS uh, five, five? Sorry, what can people expect in Zorin OS fifteen point two? Yeah, so we're mainly focusing on making it more accessible to new hardware configurations. Say, for example, um, newer. AMD GPUs as well as Intel processors. So making it work just as good uh, on newer PCs as it does on older PCs, uh, as well as just including newer versions of software, say for example, LibreOffice or GIMP so that people can work and create a lot better than they could before. How does it work on Zorin? If, for example, you release tomorrow, people who are on Zorin OS 15.1, they just uh, get a... Uh, a notification and they will click and it will update or is it a more involved process yeah so they just open up the software updater install the latest updates and well they're running 15.2 one of the interesting and this is completely from a different corner one of the interesting uh, things here in the press release that you are going to issue that you kind of see today uh you say that uh, since you released Zorin OS uh, 15 nine months ago, you've had 900,000 downloads. I think that's the first time I've uh, had a Linux distribution, or maybe not, but it's not very common that people give, uh, or that Linux distributions give these kind of numbers. Do you have a, a kind of idea how many of these downloads were more stable and how many of them were somebody was trying it in a virtual box kind of thing we don't really keep track of what kind of installation people have uh, it's just purely the download figures and the user numbers uh, so i can't really give any um figures about who's using on what kind of computer we, we just don't collect that kind of of data and would it be um, any kind of unique IP um, tracking or anything like that? I don't mean tracking in that sense, but uh, as in if one person downloaded this, the ISO image um, uh, ten, 10 times from the same PC or something, would that uh, skew your stats? No, well, we don't really keep track of IPs either. So essentially we just delete all of the IP addresses off our server as soon as they come in. 
uh, you know, for, for privacy reasons. So um, the 900,000 figure could be more, could be less. Some people uh, even download it on uh, one computer and then share the USB with other people. Say, for example, in an organization, if they're rolling out Zorn OS, they would only have it downloaded a couple of times to a couple of USBs and installed on each computer. So those figures aren't 100% representative of how big the user base is. One, one uh, reason where I've, how I find or, you know, it's quite fascinating is that you and your brother built a business around this. I'm, am I right in uh, uh, assuming that you make a living? This, this, is your, this is your nine to five, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's our full-time job and we're super thankful for all the people who have contributed and donated over the years. It's, we, we wouldn't have been able to, to get to where we are right now without that kind of support. So Which, a huge thank you to everyone. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because you are neither a purely open source uh, voluntary project nor, you, nor are you a Red Hat kind of institution. Uh, is it, uh, what is the, do you have like a end game or I don't want to say business plan, but somewhere where you would like to be, let's say in 10 or 15 years as a, as a business, would you like to, I don't know, power 40% of Irish uh, education system or something like that? Yeah, so like, especially in the coming months and years, our focus is starting to switch over towards uh, helping organizations, businesses, governments as well, make the switch over to Zorin OS and Linux at large. So uh, last month, we actually um, announced that we're going to be launching a new product called Zorin Grid in the summer. And what that is, is it's a management tool that connects to all the computers in your organization if they're running Zorn OS or later on down the line, we're going to be supporting other Linux distributions. It'll connect to all the computers in your organization and make it really simple for, you know, the IT technicians and admins to manage all of them. So essentially the goal will be to make it as easy to manage thousands of computers as it is to manage one. So they'll have a dashboard that allows them to say, install new apps, roll out software updates, you know, change security settings across their whole fleet of computers. And we think that with that kind of a tool, it will be a lot more accessible for lots of new organizations to make the switch from Windows to Linux. So that is our, our goal for the next uh, couple months and years. Uh, I can I can I can definitely see from it from a support point of view that um that that's immensely um powerful and immensely compelling, um just giving a, a, an example off the top of my head. Let's say if you com- have a computer lab of of twenty computers and you can, you can just see f- from the metrics and go oh um there's a a process um that's take that's spiking the CPU on on PC fifteen. Um, I'll just remotely kill that process and something or something like that. It's just it's it's great to have that broad overview and from a support mm-hmm. point of view. Would you say that currently most of your customers or users are institutions or uh, individuals? Yeah, at the moment the only paid for product that we have is the Ultimate Edition, which is more aimed at individual users. And say when an organization or a business approaches us saying, you know, we'd like to introduce Zorn OS on our, our computers, we actually recommend them the core edition because that's actually better suited oh, okay. than the ultimate edition because, say, ultimate includes a bunch of games, which is great for home users. Um, but honestly, the feature set that you'd have in a free version of Zorn OS, as well as other Linux distributions is, is pretty much sufficient for uh, organizational use. And with this new Zorn Grid tool, we're hoping to... Uh, charge per computer per month managed um, for this service to help finance, you know, the development of Zorn OS as well as upstream Linux projects further. Would you ever cons- uh, consider making your customizations of, of GNOME a, a Zorn desktop environment? Like, could someday, could there be a Manjaro Zorn edition or something or which which your, which your customizations of GNOME? Actually, around like five years ago, we did have our own custom desktop environment with uh, some GTK and and other components uh, baked in. But we actually decided to make the switch over to a pure GNOME shell-based desktop, and that makes it a lot easier for us to take advantage of all the new features that are coming out upstream. So 
I think it only really makes sense to um, work on the customizations and say GNOME shell extensions on top of the core GNOME desktop so that there's no wasted effort, no reinventing the wheel happening. And that essentially has been the philosophy that have, has led us to where we are today. Because uh, if we were to continue doing our own desktop environment, that would detract focus away from new features rather than having to reinvent the wheel with existing features. Just to, just to, uh, just to clarify, the, it's not just pure GNOME shells. It's very heavily customized on your side. Uh, you actually, uh, I'd imagine there's a lot of work that goes in it because uh, you offer, uh, at least in the core version, you have like two different layouts, I think, uh, or two different... Yeah, three, three, three layouts. layouts. And uh, it... Uh, I mean, you, can look, you have your own menu as well, and there's, yeah, it, there's it, quite it, a it, few customizations. It, yeah, it can look uh, quite familiar to both, uh, depending on the layout. It can look f quite familiar to people who use GNOME or to who, people who use macOS, but also to people who like that Windows 7 kind of thing with the start menu in the corner. Uh, so just to, just to uh, clarify that, is it difficult? Or, or basically, I always had that view that, or view that kind of stereotype is going around that GNOME is very difficult uh, to customize for both developers and individuals. Uh, why did you kind of, why did you choose GNOME? What does, what advantages it had over say Qt or uh, other toolkits? Yeah. So I think especially in the past five years or so, GNOME has a very noticeable focus towards um, design and uh, user interface architecture that I think really clicked with us. They, their apps have become a lot more intuitive, especially for new users, uh, as well as for enabling newer form factors. For example, you know, touch-based devices, you know, you get a lot of laptops that are convertible nowadays as well as some tablets. And we thought that the developer ecosystem as well around GNOME was pretty strong. And uh, if we wanted to support all of the latest, you know, features and hardware devices uh, that, you know, are being released every few years, uh, we thought that GNOME was definitely the best option, um, taking all that into account. Now, actually making uh, GNOME ready for ZornOS back when we were making the transition, it was quite challenging to... Um, support all of the you know user interface enhancements that we've always been shipping with since day one uh say for example having the start menu the taskbar when we uh decided to make the switch over those extensions did not exist so we had to to develop them uh nearly from scratch essentially um uh, the biggest challenges were especially about um documentation of how to make GNOME shell extensions. There wasn't an awful lot of that. So essentially we had to look through the source code of GNOME many times in order to figure out, oh, that's how you you know make this menu or make an app icon show up this way. Um, but ever since we released Zornos 12, which is the first one that had GNOME shell, um, people really, like the developer ecosystem really clicked around those extensions that we developed. Say for example, the taskbar and the start menu, um, there have been a couple forks of uh, our extensions that have actually been developed further uh, and we end up rebasing our extensions on those newer versions. So it's kind of a cyclical relationship. And I thought that was, it was really fresh and new to us. And we thought that was really powerful showing how good the developer ecosystem around GNOME Shell is. That, you know, there's lots of, extension developers that are supporting all sorts of different new ways of how to use GNOME. And we thought that was really cool. The arc menu is based off your menu, isn't it? Yeah. Same with dash to panel for the taskbar. Uh, that's really quite cool. Just when you're, when you're talking about the, the fact that you, very in the very early days, you were customizing GNOME shell um, to suit your needs. I remember, um, and I, I remember um, installing it uh, um, as it was happening in other words seeing the progression I remember the very early days of, of um, Linux Mint switching over from from um, 
uh, Gnome 2 over to um, Cinnamon, which is what they maintain at the moment. And they had their their own journey. They had their own um, customizations of, of Gnome Shell um, uh, in the very early days. And I think they they decided to go in the opposite direction of you, where you decided to not make your own desktop environment. They decided, screw this and throw the, 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 the baby out with the pram water and go, screw it we're starting from scratch we're going to make our own desktop environment and is is cinnamon which i'm I'm actually um really enjoying because i'm on manjaro cinnamon at the moment but um different philosophies and um and but fair play to you for for um continuing to um, stick with gnome and i can see that it definitely does free up resources rather than than maintaining your own desktop environment i mean Mm -hmm. um it's another project that did something very similar of course is ubuntu going from unity their own desktop environment to rebasing on gnome and now they're lightly customizing gnome for their own needs nowhere near to the extent that you you guys are but they're they're doing something very similar they've done something very similar of um uh deciding to um, base on gnome and they're therefore free up resources so that it can go into other parts of the organization mm-hmm. if you weren't uh if you didn't have your own linux distribution with its uh, own uh, heavily customized gnome what would you be using <laughs> you know i haven't really thought of that but probably just plain ubuntu to be quite honest it's the first distro that i used it's uh they have a pretty good focus towards design as well um say for example the gnome shell extensions that they do ship with it makes a lot of sense for them to be there as well as the support that's available um you know the huge community that's out there uh for a desktop that you just want to set and go with i guess ubuntu is a pretty good choice if Zornos didn't exist <laughs> have you ever had a look at pop os but Pop OS is a very interesting take on Gnome Shell. Yeah, no, they're doing a really good job there. Like, we've been taking a look at some of the enhancements that they've been doing. Um, and, you know, it's a really cool and fresh take on an Ubuntu-based distribution. And the enhancements that they've made, especially around gaming and graphics, have been pretty influential across the whole of the Linux ecosystem. And it has affected some of the, the work that we've done. Uh, towards supporting, say, Lutris and Steam so that they just work out of the box. And uh, huge kudos to System76 for, for making those enhancements. They are uh, in tru- in, no, no. They are introducing tiling, uh, like advanced tiling, into, into their, uh, into their uh, you know, version of Gnome Shell, into Pop! OS, which is uh, mm-hmm. like a... a this, that's obviously aimed at a very specific set of users. Uh, do you do your users uh, use the desktop in a, in that kind of a way that you do? Do you need to you know? Do you have to maintain documentation about keyboard shortcuts? And do you have this kind of advanced users, or are your users more uh, kind of uh, I don't want to say mouse kind of people, but mouse kind of people? Yeah, so I mean, like, we do have quite a wide range of users with different levels of experience. Uh, but uh, most of them that we tend to see uh, are just people who want to use the computer as they normally would, say, if they were using Windows or Mac. Uh, so nothing too advanced. But then again, StormOS just uses GNOME Shell. So whatever enhancements that the Pop! OS team or any other GNOME Shell extension developer make, uh, they should all be available in Zornos as well. That's one of the really good advantages of having a shared uh, technology stack. And one of the reasons why we ought to keep with GNOME Shell rather than, say, forking. Uh, I guess what I was uh, getting that, uh, basically, I think the the, the space where, uh, with uh, oh, the space of uh, this Linux distributions that are very heavily focusing on design is... Uh, quite uh, there's there's quite a lot of a lot of you you know so you have uh, obviously zorin os you have pop os you have uh, deepin is very 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 uh, design orientated you have uh, mm-hmm. uh, elementary os uh, ubuntu of course as well uh, i think uh, from the little what i've seen of latest um, of latest cinnamon that's also very very design focused what do you think um, 
you or what what are you kind of doing or do you feel uh, do you feel the need to differentiate and if so then how yeah especially over the past couple of years you know the rise of um just generally a lot more developers in the linux space uh, and new distributions have really introduced a lot more ideas out into the space in our case like we're laser focused on our main user group being people who are switching over from uh, Windows to Linux. So say, for example, elementary OS, they are taking a somewhat different approach. They're kind of thinking uh, to themselves, like, what if we made a distribution, uh, a desktop experience that, you know, makes sense without having to appeal to a specific set of users? Uh, making the switch to Linux. They have their own desktop environment that's laid out in uh, a, a completely different way to, to Zorn OS. And I think that um, among the design-focused distributions, uh, there still is quite a lot of differentiation apart from that, including um, who exactly you're targeting, especially over the next couple of years with the new focus on uh, enterprises and businesses. Uh, I think there's a big opportunity, not just in making the desktop environment more um, user-friendly, but also making the entire experience user-friendly in, in the case of, say, um, in our Ultimate Edition, we provide technical support for people who are installing Zornos for the first time. And having that hand-holding there when you need it uh, can make the difference between someone trying out Linux and say not having a great experience because they can't get their Wi-Fi working and then deciding to go back to Windows because of that. Uh, and with that level of support that's there, um, that just helps make the switch over a lot easier and uh, a lot more impactful, I think. So it's going beyond just uh, the scope of the operating system itself towards out the entire user experience. That's where we're really trying to focus. Are you going to be then integrating uh, PowerShell into into uh, <laughs> Zorin OS? Um, that, that's I mean I don't know how 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 often how, how much PowerShell is actually used by Windows users, but uh, I find it fascinating that you can actually run it on Linux and that it works well. Do you do you get? That's a very specific question, but do you get requests for that, uh, or do you, do you know if your users use PowerShell on Zorin OS? Um, honestly, I don't really know that much. Um, you can actually just download PowerShell straight from the software center. Um, it's included in the Snap Store, which uh, we pre-install in ZornOS. So essentially, you could just go into the software store, type in PowerShell, click install, and you have it. So what the Snap team have been doing is pretty powerful. And I think the fact that they're curating these apps and helping, say, even Microsoft make apps uh, delivered to Linux... Uh, I think that's a huge game changer, yeah. So that was a pretty example how a stupid question can uh, lead to much more interesting question. You have, you have, you have, you had snaps. Uh, what other, uh, what other, you know, uh, solutions for packaging software do you support in Zorin OS? Yes. Yeah, so we support uh, snaps, of course, uh, apt and dot deb packages, since we are based on Ubuntu and therefore Debian. Uh, but also, we pre-include support for Flatpak repositories in Zorn OS. Uh, we don't have any of them enabled just yet, uh, but it's something that is very simple to add. Say, if you want to add Flathub, you go onto their website, you download the Flatpak ref file, uh, you just double-click, it opens the software store, and you're able to add it straight to the desktop in a graphical way. Um, just as you were, I was just thinking there, but since you were speaking about um, elementary OS's approach to things and now we're, then we're talking about kind of software stores, um, have you ever considered the elementary OS pay what you want style store um, where they're they're kind of going off in, in that direction? Have you considered that as a potential revenue stream? Yeah, no, it's, it's something that uh, could be quite interesting especially for supporting app developers, because um, if you know anything, a lot of people say that, hey, I don't want to switch to Linux because the apps aren't available. That's starting to go away. More apps are becoming cross-platform, but it is important to give more app developers an incentive towards making apps for Linux. 
And I think that's another really great way of attracting new developers uh, to make native Linux apps. Uh, I see that the Flatpak team upstream uh, are doing some work towards supporting, you know, paid Flatpaks and uh, potentially, I think I saw supporting pay what you want. And it looks like the elementary team are collaborating with them. So I think that's something that could really strengthen the app ecosystem on Linux as a whole. I think the elementary team actually were, if I'm not, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, people, but I think that they were uh, recently having a sprint that was supported on uh, Kickstarter or something that uh, uh, crowd, crowdfunding anyway. Yeah, crowdfunding anyway to uh, to basically have the app center anywhere on any Linux distribution. So uh, if if that took off, would you be willing to include like I don't want to say that app center? Uh, would you be able, would you be willing maybe to consider changing from uh, or adding uh, uh, this kind of uh, this this project like an app, elementary app center onto Zorin OS? in order to facilitate payment for uh, developers. Yeah, it's it's an interesting proposition and um, we're closely following what they're doing uh, towards making App Center more accessible and more rich as an ecosystem. And yeah, we'd, we'd love to integrate that um, when it makes sense. Absolutely. Um, I, I, speaking of um, Pop os earlier i think the pop shop is a is a fork or a close fork of the elementary os um, store as well so mm -hmm. i think i saw uh on their crowdfunding campaign like they're not saying specifically um trying to get other linux distros to have the app center software uh you know baked in but rather supporting their own flat pack repository and features that they're developing that are inside of their own app center across other app centers, say for example, GNOME software, which is what we include in Zorin OS by default. So it's more uh, of a... So it's, yeah, it's more of a wide um, project. At least that's that's what I think it looks like. Um, I need to take a much closer look at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's needless to say because the um, the, the, the sprint was uh, either quite, quite recent or is ongoing. I, I, I don't know what the timeline of it is that um the details are are yet to come out so it's it's, it's uh, don't worry we're not putting you on the spot that much that that you were expecting you like have the answers now <laughs> um mm -hmm. no i think their their crowdfunding campaign is still going on uh, they're just about finishing it up so you know listeners take a look and uh contribute if, if you wish to make the linux app system more vibrant I I think one of their stretch goals is they have doubled the uh, their initial asking, and they say if they reach that stretch goal, then they will do another sprint later on. So you, if they double their stretch goal, essentially you you get two sprints. Um, it has to be mentioned that um Zorin OS and yourself is based in this fair city of ours, old Dublin. Um, do you find the strong tech industry here to be an advantage? I think the tech community around here really does um, expand our way of thinking beyond just, say, for example, a Linux-based project, but thinking how to make you know, Zorn West and Linux more accessible towards all sorts of different users, including tech companies. And the mentality that they have around, you know, building um, an organization that's sustainable, that's, um, you know, self-funding, I think is something that, you know, we have uh, adapted from the tech ecosystem here. So we're not a pure play uh, open source community project, but we're also not a pure play for profit only business. Um, I think, you know, the cross-pollination of ideas that um, the community here has um, really does influence our thinking and just widens our scope of, you know, who are we trying to target the most? What are uh, our goals essentially for Zorin OS and our company? Would you, um, I don't know if you've done this in the past, but would you ever consider like almost having 
a, a showcase booth at a, a conference or something like that, or Dublin makers, kind of, that, that kind of makery, tinkery kind of audience, would you ever consider um, having that kind of a presence in, in the local community? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, at the moment, we're just a very small team, um, two of us on the core team, as well as a couple freelance developers. But we are hoping to expand the team and, you know, have a bit more of an impact on the ecosystem here uh, and the community here. So, yeah, it's something that would be exciting. Well, um, I think that you've eventually exhausted all of our questions. <laughs> uh, Mike, I don't know if you have any um, any more is there anything you'd like to ask us, Zorin? Uh, I keep calling you Zorin. That's awful. It's uh, because of the... Mr. Zorin. Mr. Zorin, yeah. Is there anything you'd like to ask us, Mr. Zorin? Um... Off the top of my head, not really. But like, <laughs> uh, I guess I guess um, uh, in your upcoming events uh, that you're having here in Dublin, uh, I see you've been uh, kind of focused more on, um, you know, having new kind of um one-off events uh as well as the community um uh, meetups uh what made you think about making that um kind of switch over uh so you you're basically referring to the uh, dublin linux community uh events uh where all three of us are uh, are organizers as uh, as well as uh, you know uh, two other people uh, Camilla and uh, and Dudley uh, well basically uh, we we don't we we still focus on the on the on the meetups on the two uh, two meetup meetups every month one in a pub one in a uh, one in a more uh, you know computer friendly uh, uh, alcohol free environment and uh but we think that uh i mean that's what i think about it connor might have a completely different idea uh you know new events uh, new kind of events uh helping to get out there outside the scope of a meetup maybe show some uh you know to explore what what other people want to know and see and what other people want to know about linux and how to how to show them the good of linux and how to introduce it to them that's uh, uh that's interesting and uh, you know some some things uh, you just can't do in a meetup. Some things uh, like talks uh, are definitely a one-off thing. So if you want to, uh, I just had an idea. This can get deleted. Uh, but if you ever wanted to have a talk on uh, how to like any, if you ever wanted to submit a talk, for example, on how to how to make your own Linux distribution or and or run a Linux-based business, that would definitely be interesting, at least to me. Um, yeah, certainly. But uh, back to back to the main thread in my head. Uh, yeah, basically, we, we we try to do new things because uh, uh, you know we have passion for Linux, all of us, and open source, and it's uh, it, uh, it's important uh, for us to to at least for me again to 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 work with that and to show it to other people and to create a bigger and and richer community. Um, I would like to echo um some of Mike's points here. So the my primary motivation is to have regular meetups. So they're 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 dependable. They're um so it's predictable. If you can say, oh, I'm not going to make that one. Oh, there's going to be one soon after that. So it's it's predictable. So that's the reason why there's there's two regular meetups um one is in a pub and some one is in a kind of a coffee um environment um more than for the sake that those two um tend to attract different types of crowds you're free to attend both if you want to um but yeah it's the grassroots um my motivations are definitely grassroots um so uh, I would absolutely love if somebody came in off the street and said, "I have no idea what is this Linux thing. I've no idea what it is." Uh, I would say, "Oh, it's well, it's another operating system like your Windows, like your Mac, and uh, that you may be familiar with." And this is a, f a free operating system in, and then go on um, that uh, explanation path. Um, so, and that I find that to be very motivating, very empowering, just to introduce somebody to some an, a concept that they've they've never been introduced to before 
Um, but I completely understand that the Linux um, community and the, le- the Linux ecosystem also has a lot of very technical people. So they, they use Linux in their day-to-day, their sysadmins, they, um, uh, they are managing servers there um, and just... That is how they, they that is their day to day. So they're run they're running a Linux server or interacting with a Linux server as part of their day to day job. So it's there's a spectrum there, and it's important to get the balance between the two because if you exclusively aim for one, then you end up alienating the other. If you're um, aiming for the very technical people, the twenty year sysadmin, twenty year veteran sysadmins, and and so on and so forth you'll end up uh, isolating people. You'll probably uh, end up isolating me because I do not have that level of knowledge, nor um, at the moment would I, uh, would a, a, an in-depth talk in, in that direction actually would interest me because that is just currently in my career path. I just do not have the that interest or do not have the knowledge in order to be able to uh, discern the that information that will be coming in my direction. Oh, uh, then, of course, if you aim for the complete uh, newbie, the Linux newbie, you'll end up I- uh, isolating the people who are coming along saying, oh, uh, I use Linux day to day. Is this community going to be accommodating to me as well? So it's important to find the balance between the two. So primarily the motivation for the uh, the regular meetups is the social aspect. Um, is people just hanging out um shooting the breeze and gradually bit by bit it's it's going to be a long process of no uh, illusions of 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 it happening quickly but gradually bit by bit you start to get regulars and they start to hang out in or we have a telegram chat start to hang out in the telegram chat and then um you you get to build up that kind of community yourself the camaraderie the people's helping each other out and and when they've they've those kind of questions as they come up um and the the one-off events are uh unfortunately one-off uh, i would like to have them more regularly but as you grow as a or as an organization you have to start somewhere so the one-off events that you you mentioned like um uh, where we have uh, we had one in the past where we invited a, an Intel engineer to talk about Clear Linux, and we have one coming up in the future that is uh, Lightning Talks. So we're inviting community members to submit um, Lightning Talks ideas, and also there will be some Microsoft engineers there as well. So that is the integ- integration between um, and the a merger and contrast between ordinary Joe Shopes uh, off the street who want to give I say oh I want to do a talk okay yeah there's your platform you can t- give a talk if you if you have the idea and if you want to do it and also there'll be people from industry there there'll be a guy from Microsoft um, uh, talk about PowerShell or talk about uh, Windows subsystem for Linux or talking about Azure or whatever they want to do so there's and then the you all get to hang out in the pub afterwards and you might get to ask some questions informally to one of those Microsoft engineers. That's all the the mingling and merging of, of, of ideas and, and so that's the my my motivation for it. Anyway. Anyway, so we have a couple of shout outs. Um my shout out is Ba U. Um it's formerly called F Pacman. And is a graphical interface for managing your Linux applications slash packages. It is able to manage uh, AOR, app image, flat pack, snap, and native web applications. And we will include the GitHub uh, page in the show notes. Um, and looking through the, there's some um, gifs of of the uh, of the interaction with the. Uh, user interface and it actually looks to be to be um quite interesting um some of the very bright colors may not be to my taste but i'm sure um they'll be um um, maybe you might be able to theme it later on or and change the theme but the core functionality of the app certainly looks very good and it's um 
tangentially leads into our previous conversation about all the different things like snaps and flat packs and, and so on was so so forth. So it's an interesting front end for all of your packaging needs. Yeah, my shout out my shout out is uh, NCDU, uh, which is basically a disk usage analyzer for the command line. It's uh, an amazing uh, NCurses program that uh, basically shows you what is taking up all the space on your disk and lets you delete it. Obviously, show, a link is also going to be in the show notes. Uh, we also have an event to uh, to promote. Connor? Yes, indeed. We do have an uh, event to uh, shout out. So we should be at Fast Talk Live 2020. Um, I've not yet booked my flights and accommodation. Sorry, Joe. Um, but we should be there um, uh, ensuring that all all that goes ahead, that um, the hotel doesn't burn down or anything like that. Um, and it's in the 20th of June 2020 in uh the Harrison in King's Cross in London. So, and it's it's really interesting. Uh, it's really fun to, when you're there. It's in a basement in the pub and you get to hang out with a lot of cool Linux community people. It's, uh, yeah, we've been a few times and it's amazing. Uh, before we, before we, uh, before we, uh, you know, sh- talk about our socials, uh, Artyom, any socials uh, for you or for, uh, for Zorin OS? Any, anything to yes yeah, so uh on twitter we're at zorin os um we're also on facebook uh if you use facebook uh don't really do an awful lot of socials uh on uh on the internet though um but yeah give it a look what do your user or do you have like a community of users that would like online community of users you know some projects are more active on reddit some are on more telegram some are on irc do you have like a bias towards one of those or, or maybe do yeah actually uh we have a, a forum that is not only just for help but uh we have a lot of community members just talking about what interests them so uh take a look at it on our uh Zorn West community forum all right so link is going to be in the show notes uh obviously our socials as shane started to put it are uh, just there as well if you want to see them briefly it's a Linux at Linux Lads on Telegram on Twitter, a Linux Lads channel or Linux dot com slash Telegram for Telegram. We are also no Mastodon. If you look for Linux Lads, you'll find us. Uh, you can email show at Linux dot com, um, and uh, that's pretty much it. We are. I think there is a fa- yeah. There's definitely a Facebook uh, page, but. Uh, uh, there's just that uh, that meme of tumbleweed going around. Uh, not, not, <laughs> not not much life in there. Uh, you can support us at uh, linuxlets.com slash beer or linuxlets.com slash support or linuxlets.com slash donate. I think those are just aliases for the same website. And uh, that's it. Um, throw us some money for a coffee or help us with things like web hosting and things like that so uh, donations are very much appreciated yeah and with that this is the end of uh, today's episode uh, i've been mike i've been connor and i've been rtm bye bye see you